Good afternoon, my beloved brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, young people and friends. We've just had before us read the exciting prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 38, haven't we? And in Ezekiel chapter 38, we've read in verse 13 of Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish. And what we'd like to do this afternoon, God willing, is to, to really examine who Tarshish might be. And obviously I believe, as you can see from the screen, that the um, British power answers to the power of Tarshish. And I'm sure a lot of good traditional Christadelphians would also accept this. However, if challenged, if questioned as to why, if questioned as to give forth proof, some of us might struggle. And so what we'd like to do today, particularly for a new generation of younger people coming up, is hopefully to give some compelling evidence to show how it is reasonable to believe that when we read Tarshish here, that in fact we are reading about the very country that we're in right now, the very country of Great Britain. And so it's a very exciting and relevant study for us all to do uh, this day. Now Ezekiel chapter 38 is all about a time period called the latter days and we're given some clues about what these latter days are going to be like particularly in relation to the nation of Israel so we've got on the screen four kind of key suggestions key points firstly Israel are going to be restored they're going to be gathered back to their to their ancient homeland there's going to be controversy in an area called the mountains of Israel because this is the focal point of where a, a, a confederacy, of, confederacy of nations under a character called Gog in verse 2, invades. We, in, we see in verse 12 that they are wealthy, and, uh, uh, and that's another reason for the invasion. And in verse, verses 8 and 11, perhaps the only one that we might suggest is not quite there just yet, is that they are dwelling without bars and gates, and the nation of Israel are dwelling safely. And that there on the screen is a, is a shot of a, um, uh, a kibbutz, and when you go to Israel, all the Jewish settlements, the kibbutzes, they all have these bars and gates all around them. You can tell the difference between a Jewish settlement and an Arab settlement because of a characteristic like that. So maybe that's the only one that we could say that isn't quite on track. They are back in their land, aren't they? This means that we are in the latter days. There is controversy on the mountains of Israel. You know, as Israel are building settlements on their ancient homeland in the West Bank area, we know that the international community views this a little bit, un, uh, you know, crossly because they view it as being an illegal uh, building. So there is controversy on the mountains, and Israel is indeed wealthy. You know, they've just found all that gas off the, off the shore, and we know there's a massive boom in their technical um, economy at the moment. So the only one really that may not be quite on track is that one there, but how quickly, brethren and sisters, things could change. So we are very much in the latter days with Israel back in their land. And this is really the picture that we get from Ezekiel chapter 38, isn't it? It's not really our subject today to deal with verses 1 through to 7, which kind of lists out all the ancient names of ancient territories of nations that are confederate together who come against Israel. But uh, we did deal with this um, briefly in the Northern Prophecy Day. So if anyone's interested in looking at some of these things, um, head over to uh, and get a, a, get a CD or DVD for what we did in the Northern Prophecy Day last year. And as we say, this great confederacy it invades Israel, but there's another power block, another group of nations mentioned in verse 13. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto Gog, Art thou come unto thee? Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Tarshish. You know, that's a, a name, isn't it, that we're not very familiar with. It's not used today in our modern um, vocabularies. So this is a concealed matter, isn't it, brothers and sisters? And we know the proverb well. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honour of kings is to search out a matter. And so, brothers and sisters, as hopeful kings and queens of the age to come, we now, it is now our honour to search out this matter. 
So where do we start then to kind of understand how we might piece together the evidence of who Tarshish is? Well, there are in fact 24 verses which contain the word Tarshish. And you'd be pleased to know we're not going to go through every single one of these today. Um, but we are going to look at um, quite a few of them. And what we've done is we've, we've kind of broken them up into different sections to help us do that. So we're going to definitely look at least at one passage from each of these sections. And we've we split it up into two, really. There's a historical records of Tarshish. So, um, for example, in the time of the kings, we read about Tarshish doing this and that and whatever. So there's historical accounts of a literal nation, a literal power called Tarshish in the ancient world. And hopefully by piecing together some of the clues that we get from the historical, we'll also be able to then look at the prophetical. And as we've seen in Ezekiel 38, the power of Tarshish is alive and well, is it not, brothers and sisters, in the latter days, in the time period when Israel is back in their land, in our day to day. And so as Bible students, we should be able to identify, surely, who Tarshish is, so that when we look at our news stories, and we see articles relating to the subjects of Ezekiel 38, for example, we can see that Britain is indeed, or Tarshish is indeed, at work. So, I hope you're all with me. That's my preamble. Let's get on with it. These are the, we're going to look at eight Tarshish clues from the sections that I showed just previously. And the first one, it's always good, isn't it, in any study, to start at the beginning. So let's go to Genesis and chapter 10 to find out a little bit about the beginning of this power. And here in Genesis chapter 10, we have what is known as the table of nations, don't we? These are the uh, descendants of Noah, and we read about Tarshish as being a person at the very, very beginning of these times. So, for example, in verse 1... It says, now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. And then in verse 2, we have the sons of jo uh, Japheth, and it lists them out. And under the sons of Japheth, in verse 4, we read, and the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. So Tarshish was a person. Originally, and he was a descendant of Japheth, who was a descendant of Noah. And that's interesting because Josephus, in his Antiquities of the Jews, he uh, explains how that migration took place in ancient times. And what he says is that the descendants of Japheth went into Europe. So, whoever uh, Tarshish is, brothers and sisters, we're going to have to see how that fits with this. Tarshish, the power that became Tarshish, is going to be Japhethite in origin. It's going to be in the West. It's not going to be in Africa. It's not going to be in China. It's going to be somewhere in Europe, we'd very strongly suggest to you. And just notice another thing in verse 5. It says, of the descendants of Japheth, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands... Everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. And the word for isle is, is really, it could mean an island or a coastal area. So again, I think we're getting a suggestion here that, that wherever Tarshish is, wherever this, uh, this, the descendants of this man ended up, it will probably be in a coastal or island region. So that's clue number one. A descendant of Japheth in Europe somewhere. How about this one then? This is, the, this is clue number two. We're going to actually fast forward now to the time of the kings around 900 BC, 800 BC, around the time of King Solomon. So let's flick forward to 2 Chronicles and chapter 9. And we're going to pick up another one of our Tarshish clues here in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 9. Because as I mentioned earlier, we do have an account of now this uh, people that have come out of Tarshish, the, the man... This people are now doing things. They're famous for particular characteristics of their nation. So, for example, 2 Chronicles chapter 9. We'll just actually read verse 20. And all the drinking vessels of King Solomon were of gold. And all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver. 
It was not anything accounted of in the days of Solomon. For the king's ships went to Tarshish with the servants of Hiram. Every three years, once, came the ships of Tarshish, bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. And King Solomon passed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. So the first thing I wanted you to note, brothers and sisters, is, is now we have a, a, a people called Tarshish. And what are they famous for? Well, they're famous for their ships, the ships of Tarshish. And we've put up on the screen other passages which refer to the ships of Tarshish. So this power is renowned, is famous for its maritime supremacy. And in the time of Solomon, it really was one of those powers which helped Solomon to surpass all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom under God's um, care and blessing. It was this deal that was done between Hiram, Tarshish and Solomon that enabled Solomon to become one of the richest of all the kings of the earth. And that leads us to clue number two. Because here you see... When we read of the ships of Tarshish, what are they bringing? Well, they're bringing gold and silver and ivory and apes and peacocks in verse 21. And do you know what's interesting about uh, the words apes and peacocks? I understand the experts say that linguistically, these two um, in the Hebrew are actually Indian in origin for apes and peacocks. And so from the port of Ezi and Geba, it seems... I put that on the screen. It reminds me a little bit of Barnaby, so I thought I'd uh, <laughs> pop that up there. But from... <laughs> People say we look alike. <laughs> <laughs> but, from, but from this uh, passage, uh, Solomon had a port, you see, in the south, didn't he? In, in, in modern Elat, in Ezi and Geba. And so it seems that whatever deal that was done here between the three parties, it enabled trade to be done with the east. Now, brothers and sisters, it doesn't necessarily mean, in my view that we have to look for Tarshish in the east. I know brethren do connect it with the east, and there is definitely an eastern connection. But I only ever read in our scriptures, don't we? We only ever read of one Tarshish. So although there might be links with the east, I'd suggest that perhaps Tarshish isn't actually in the east. And in fact, Herodotus records that, very interestingly, that the Phoenicians had actually, and did frequently, circumnavigate Africa. And interestingly... What he tells us, Herodotus, is that they, it, that journey actually took three solid years. So it seems to me that Tarshish could be anywhere along these things, although in the time of Solomon, it definitely traded with India and brought some of those things back to King Solomon so that Solomon could become re rich. So not only um, there were the Phoenicians in Tyre trading in the west, but also, quite clearly here, Tarshish has a connection to the east. And the reason why I think we need to really look in the west is because of a passage, again in the time of the kings, but this time from Jonah. You remember what happens. Jonah wants to flee from the presence of God. And notice what it says in Jonah chapter 1, verse 3. It says, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish. So Jonah had decided, I'm going to flee as far away from God's presence in Jerusalem that I can possibly get. And he determines in his mind, he's going to go to Tarshish. That was the furthest point away in his brain. And he says there, he's going to flee to Tarshish. So if you were going to flee to Tarshish, obviously you'd go to the, to the port that helped you get there the quickest. And interestingly enough, he gets down, doesn't he, to the seacoast, to Joppa, which is modern-day Jaffa, on the um, western coast. And so it's a very clear indicator that wherever Tarshish is, if you want to get there quickly from Israel, you're going to have to go west. So Tarshish is located to the west, is another clue. And just to, in, to kind of add back up to that, I came across this um, archaeological find the other day and I, I just find it absolutely absolutely exciting because not only does it confirm that Tarshish was a real um, nation in ancient times it also shows us a couple of other things so this is a inscription by a Syrian king Esar Haddon uh, just around the time of Ezekiel and he inscribes this he says all the kings from the lands surrounded by sea from the country Ladanana, Cyprus, and Laman, the Ionian Islands, just off Greece, I think, 
as far as Tarshish bowed to my feet. So what does that tell us? Well, he's saying to us that Tarshish was a land surrounded by sea. In other words, brothers and sisters, Esar Haddon believed that Tarshish was an island. And he'd know because this power bowed to his feet. And also, brothers and sisters, it seems that as he's explaining all these island powers that bowed to his feet, that he's starting with Cyprus and going across the Mediterranean. And the furthest point that he knows in the West that bowed to him was a power called Tarshish. A very interesting passage there that I just wanted to intersperse with, um, with that point. In the West is where we would look for the nation of Tarshish. Now this next one is, is very, very interesting. Could you turn to Ezekiel chapter 27, please? Now we're going forward a little bit in time now to around 600 BC. We're going to the time period of the prophet Ezekiel. And here we have a prophecy all about Tyre. Now we've already kind of mentioned Tyre. Hiram was the king of Tyre, a Phoenician power, an ancient Phoenician um, power, an ancient civilization known for their trade for their, uh, their kind of um, colonization of small trading posts throughout the world. They weren't a military power. They weren't one of the great superpowers of their day, but they were, mili- they were traders. And they actually, interestingly enough, it says in Amos, they had a, a brotherly covenant with Israel, didn't they? And you know that Hiram, he helped to supply some of the materials to build the temple, didn't he? In the time of David and Solomon. Uh, yet, unfortunately, it seems they, they did not continue in the ways of Hiram. And so there are a couple of uh, prophecies we're going to look at now, shortly, which talk about how God was going to punish Tyre, the Tyrians. So, for example, look at this, Ezekiel 27, verse 2. Now, thou son of man, Ezekiel, take up a lamentation for Tyrus. And say unto Tyrus, O thou that art situate at the entry of the sea, which are to merchants of the people for many isles. Thus saith Adonai Yahweh, O Tyrus, thou hast said, I am of perfect beauty. And the passage goes on to explain that this was going to be a prophecy against the pride of Tyre. And so in verses 5 through to 7, we get the greatness of Tyre's ships. In verses 8 through to 11, the personnel of Tyre and how amazing they thought they were. In verses 12 to 25, we read all about the traders that came to Tyre to sell things. And in verses 26 to 36, we read of the impending doom of the city. But what we're interested in is the section that's all about the traders with Tyre. Verses 12 to 25. Look at verse 12, for example. We read there of the power we're trying to identify. Tarshish. Was thy merchant, by reason of the multitude of all kind of riches, with silver, iron, tin, and lead, they traded in thy fairs. Now, why is that interesting, brothers and sisters? Well, I'll tell you why it's interesting. Because when you actually um, piece together the rest of the verses in that section, what you realize is, is that when we have these um, ancient names mentioned, for example, in verse 21, we have Arabia and Kedar, what is being told to us is that the indigenous things that they had at their, in their nations were being brought to trade at Tyre. So, for example, Arabia and Kedar brought lambs, rams and goats. And in verse 22, for example, Sheba and Rama, they brought spices, precious stones and gold. These were commodities which were indigenous to the regions from which these ancient nations came. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that Tarshish had these four metals indigenous to where it was. So whoever Tarshish is, brothers and sisters, we have to demonstrate that these four metals were readily available in the the territory that we are suggesting it sits. And this is very fascinating, isn't it? Because again, we've got another um, non-biblical reference to back up the the biblical account that Tarshish was famous for its metals. Here is one of the, I think it is um, in archaeological terms, the oldest reference in archaeological finds to the Jewish temple ever discovered. And it's on a pottery fragment called an ostracon. 
And on this ostracum, it mentions the silver of Tarshish. So it's very, very interesting to find that specifically Tarshish is mentioned with this metal here. And we know from the biblical account, though, that it can't just be silver. We're looking for a power with iron, tin and lead readily available within it. So that's that. Just before we move on from Ezekiel 27, just notice one other quick thing. In verse 25, we have the ships again. The ships of Tarshish did sing of thee in thy market, and thou wast replenished and made very glorious in the midst of the seas. And so it seems that the power of Tarshish and the ships, probably called the ships of Tarshish because they had to travel long distances, and so they had to be quite robust to, uh, to be able to, uh, to take on the high seas, so to speak. These ships of Tarshish, they were um, absolutely crucial in enabling all these goods to come to the ancient Phoenician power of Tyre. I just wanted to point that out because as we go through, we'll see that that's quite an interesting point. So, that's clue number five. Wherever Tarshish is, it's going to be a source of silver, iron, tin and lead. And now I'd like to go to Isaiah 23. And this is another one of those passages which is a prophecy against Tyre, the Phoenicians, just to the north of Israel in Lebanon is their territory or was their territory. And we read in Isaiah 23, another prophecy against that place. The burden of Tyre, verse 1. Howl, ye ships of Tarshish, for it is laid waste, so that there is no house, no entering in from the land of Kittim. It is revealed to them. So Tyre was to be destroyed. And the ships of Tarshish, so crucial in, in generating wealth for, for Tyre, were going to howl at the time when Tyre was destroyed. But look at verse 6. Look what it says about the power of the Phoenicians, the influence of the Tyrians. It says, Pass ye over to Tarshish. Howl ye inhabitants of the isle. Is this your joyous city, whose antiquity is of ancient days? Her own feet shall carry her afar off to sojourn. I think this is telling us, brothers and sisters, that when the power of the Phoenicians in Tyre was to fall, that that power, that influence, was to be carried afar off and was eventually going to land in Tarshish because that's where it was going to pass over to. And wherever Tarshish is, it says in verse 7 that her feet would carry her afar off. So we're not looking for a place in and around where Tyre was. We're looking for a place far away that would take over from the influence of the trading power of Phoenicia of old. So that's clue number six. It's going to take over from Tyre. Just two more. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 38 that we read uh, just a few moments ago. Because in Ezekiel 38, now bear in mind we're fast forwarding right to our time today. We're going to find a couple of clues mentioned about Tarshish just before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. So in verse 13, we've already mentioned it, we read of Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof. So what do we think it means when it talks about the young lions of Tarshish? Well, the context here is quite clearly political powers, isn't it? You've got Sheba and Dedan, their names of ancient nations we'll look at just in, in a moment, God willing. We've got Tarshish, which we've shown is a, a power. And these young lions are of Tarshish. Now, I don't think they, these are literal lions, do you? Like running around. Because the context here is political powers. But what I'd like to do, brothers and sisters, is just comment on that word for young lions. You know, it's translated lion 30 times, villages once, and young once. And it's a very interesting word. In fact, can we flick over to Ezekiel chapter 19, please, just to understand perhaps a bit of a deeper meaning of what a young lion is. So in Ezekiel chapter 19, if you look at, um, well, we'll read from verse 1. Moreover, take thou up a lamentation for the princes of Israel, and say, What is thy mother, a lioness? She lay down among lions, she nourished her whelps among young lions. And she brought up one of her whelps, it became a young lion, 
and it learned to catch the prey. It devoured men. The nations also heard of him. He was taken in their pit and they brought him with chains unto the land of Egypt. Now, the context here again is, is political powers, but this time it's talking about princes in Israel. And, but notice what happens. We have a process in verse 3. You start off with whelps, baby lions, reliant on their mother. But these whelps don't stay whelps for long. And they become young lions, capable of catching their own prey. In other words, a young lion is an independent power of its mother. And I think that's the sense in which we see the word used here in Ezekiel chapter 38. These young lions, they are political powers that have become independent of their mother, yet still slightly related. So when we read of Tarshish with all the young lions, we're reading of offspring, political offspring of Tarshish. So whoever Tarshish is, we have to be able to demonstrate clearly that there has been political offspring from it that has become independent of it and grown up and left home so to speak but is still slightly related to that original Tarshish mother lion power so that's clue number seven a colonial power having independent political offspring clue number eight and again it's here we've read uh, that Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof shall say unto Gog Art thou come to take a spoil? Now notice the detail here, brothers and sisters. Sheba and Dedan are clearly the native powers in the vicinity of the area of the invasion somehow. But Tarshish isn't there, is it, brothers and sisters? The merchants of Tarshish are there. So this gives us another clue, doesn't it? That the traders of Tarshish will be in the area of Sheba and Dedan, and they're going to say to Gog, have you come to take a spoil from, these, from this area, it seems to be implying. And so, brothers and sisters, we have to ask the question, well, well if we can, where, where's Sheba and Dedan? Because if we can find a little bit out about where they are, in the latter days, in our times now, if we look at that area, we should be able to see whoever we believe Tarshish might be to be operating in that area. And I'm going to just suggest to you, um, the sun's shining on the screen there, but hopefully you can see this area here in the Gulf is where we would identify Sheba and Dedan with. Let me just give you a little bit of evidence for that. Um, I'm just going to uh, quote from the second one down here. This is um, in, in Turkey, and it's actually uh, an inscription made about the victories of Augustus uh, in, uh, around AD 14, this inscription was written. And we read, in Arabia, the army penetrated as far as the territory of the Sabaeans. And that's the ancient name connected to the Shabians, Sheba. And the town of Marib. Now, the town of Marib is there in modern Yemen, um, just down here, there. And so we've got a clear kind of indicator there from an ancient text about 600 years or so just off from Ezekiel of where the ancient territory of Sheba is. It's down there in the Gulf area. Here's another one about Dedan. I like this one. It's an ancient graffiti inscription from Al-Ullah. Al-Ullah is, uh, is, a, is a kind of an oasis town up there in Saudi Arabia. And I just think it's quite funny because uh, these are ancient bits of graffiti, you know. So if you, if you think, oh, I might just uh, write down here, Matt Davies was here, Rugby Prophecy Day 2014, you never know, one day it might become relevant to someone. And that's what's happened here because we've got Rachmiel, son of Buzrat, he camped in Dedan. And he'd scrawled that, Rachmiel did, on, on a, little, um, a little stone in Al-Ullah. And the archaeologists have come along and gone, oh look, look at this, this place, uh, and there's loads of these by the way, was called Dedan in ancient times. And so we can be quite confident that, that this area of the Gulf, brothers and sisters, is indeed the area of Sheba and Dedan of old. And uh, there's a couple of other passages there from Isaiah and Jeremiah which equate Dedan to the area of Arabia. So there's our clues done. Whoever Tarshish is, brothers and sisters, they're going to be a descendant of Japheth. 
They're going to be a maritime power. They're going to have traded in global markets in the time of the kings. They're going to be located to the west of Israel. They're going to be a source of silver, iron, tin, and lead. They're going to have traded with Tyre and then take over from Tyre. They're going to be a colonial power in the latter days, or at least have become a colonial power by the time of the latter days. And they're going to have be trading in the Gulf in the latter days. So the question that we've got to ask is, does Britain fit the bill? So let's see. Let's test it. Clue number one. Is Britain in the area of Europe? Well, yes. And so we can be happy with that clue. Next port of call, so to speak. Is Britain a maritime power? Yes, Britain is very famous. Its, it's uh, maritime activities stretch right back into the mists of history, don't they? It is a maritime power. Did it trade in global markets in ancient times? Well, look at this. They uh, found a ship um, in 2010 off of Salcombe in Devon. And they dated it from 900 BC. So this is the time of Solomon, brothers and sisters. And they, they found quite clearly that this proved that uh, Britain, the Isle of Britain, was trading in the Bronze Age, in the time of Ezekiel. In fact, one of the divers, or the engineers, Jim Tyson, who took part in the dive, said it shows definite communications and trade. These people were trading as we would these days. So Britain did trade in ancient times. We're going to see more evidence for that, by the way, in a couple of other slides we've got later. Is it located to the west? Well, yes. If you wanted to get from Israel to Britain quickly, you would leave probably from around that area there by boat in Joppa like Jonah did. And this really, this next one, clue number five, really is the clincher in my view when pieced together with all the other clues. So the question is, is, is Britain a source of silver, iron, tin and lead? And not only that, I think we've got to ask three key questions. Does Britain have these minerals in it? Can we see or demonstrate that they were actually mined in ancient times? And can we demonstrate that they were traded with the Phoenicians? Because if we can demonstrate all these three things, we can be pretty sure that there's a good match here for Britain being Tarshish. So first question, does Britain have these minerals? And Ruth and I... We, uh, we happened to find ourselves on holiday once in near Derbyshire, in the Derbyshire uh, Mining Museum. And um, in that museum, you can go and see all the rocks that are indigenous to Britain. And sure enough, you can find four minerals from which silver, iron, tin and lead can come. And what's fascinating, brothers and sisters, is particularly the tin. Because the tin is a very, very rare mineral. And it's only in very few places on the earth. And yet tin was absolutely crucial to the ancient world. In fact, the, uh, the Greeks, they, would have, they, would have, they, they, they wouldn't have been able to dress if it wasn't for tin because for the bronze that was made in the ancient world, you had to mix tin with the copper. And so tin was crucial to the ancient world. There must have been a place where tin came from in order for the Greeks, for example, to have their bronze. Were these minerals mined in ancient times. Well, we can definitely be sure that they were mined at the time of the Romans. When the Romans came, these, this is from a history book showing all the different mines that the Romans set up. And um, here's, uh, here's something from uh, Mining and Metology in the Greek and Roman World, a book, where the experts there list where the Romans got all their iron from, and tin, and lead. And you'll see there that silver, tin, lead and iron, they were all coming from the territory of Britannia. Interestingly, Iberia is there as well. So um, the Romans also got some of their metals, those four metals from Spain. But when we equate all of the clues with, um, with what we've been looking at, clearly Britain is going to be the only one that fits the bill. I don't think uh, Spain really can be fit, fitted across the other clues. But it's a contender in this particular clue, but as we say, we can discount it slightly when we equate it with the rest. And not only were these minerals mined, definitely in Roman times, bear in mind this is 600 years off from Ezekiel. Um, oh, I've got ahead of myself there. You'll find that um, they weren't just mined, they were actually um, processed 
And so you can go to various places in England and actually see Roman processed metals um, of the four types that we're looking for. And this one here is very, very interesting, quite famous, the St. Moore's Tin Ingot. And it's very, very famous because it was thought to date when they did their tests on it from 2000 BC in Britain, trading in tin from those ancient times. But did they trade with the Phoenicians? Well, here's a, a clip from the BBC from 2010, a few years ago. They found uh, a boy dead um, from uh, near Stonehenge. And they dug him up and they did a few tests. And they found that he was 3,550 years old. And um, what's interesting is, is that they discovered by their various tests that this boy was in fact of Mediterranean origin. So people from the Mediterranean, the Phoenician area, they had come over to Britain. Um, and, excuse me, and one of the interesting things about that, um, that wreck I showed you earlier was that when they dug it up, they found no shadow of a doubt that these were traders because they found tin ingots, 28 of them, I think, um, 27, in fact, tin ingots on board that wreck that dated from the time of Solomon. Now, why do you have 27 tin ingots on your boat traveling across the British Channel? Well, you have them there because you're going to go and trade them. And where are you going to trade them with? Well, Britain's got tin. So it's going towards the Mediterranean to trade in those uh, markets across the way. And that's not the only one. There's another one there in 1991, I believe that was. They found a hoard of 44 tin ingots by the River Erne in southwest Devon um, around the British Bronze Age in date. So they, find, they found evidence to show that Britain traded in these things at the time of Solomon. I like this bit of evidence, actually, myself, because it's got a, some fancy names. So this is a periplus of the Ethrian Sea. What's a periplus? Well, a periplus is like um, a list. You know if you were an ancient sailor and you went over to that port over there, and that, that ancient port, it had tons of grain, it was selling it off cheap, but they were really chilly and cold, so they wanted a lot of cloth, and they didn't have any cloth. So you'd think, ah, oh, I'd note that down, they've got loads of grain, they don't want that, but they want cloth. And then you go to the, to the port over the other side of the Ethrian Sea, and you find another port, and it's, well, they've got tons of cloth, they're bored of it, but they're hungry, and they need lots of grain. So you'd note it down in your periplus. And then if you could establish a trade route between the two, it'd be, life would be really easy, wouldn't it? Because you just travel to one, buy the cheap stuff, sell one, the other stuff, and then travel over to the other and sell it at a price and make yourself a nice profit, and then buy the, the, the commodities that are readily available from that port, and so on. So if you were a sailor in the ancient times, this was a really important piece of equipment, your periplus. And every ancient sailor would have had one. And this one is particularly interesting because it dates to approximately 30 AD. You know, not far off the time of Ezekiel uh, when we put it into context. And this particular sailor, he went around the eastern area of the ancient world, noting down what they were importing and what they were exporting. And interestingly, tin is mentioned four times. But every time he mentions tin, he mentions it as an import, never as an export. And so what's really interesting about that is it tells us that the tin that was sought, being sourced by the ancient world was not coming from the east, brothers and sisters. Tin was not being mined in the east in the, in the, Western wo in the ancient world. It was coming from somewhere in the west. And as we've demonstrated, we've got evidence, haven't we, to show that the tin was coming from Britain, the very nation that we live in, from the nation that the Bible calls Tarshish. If you want some more evidence? Okay. Here's Herodotus. Bear in mind, this is about 200 years off the time of Ezekiel. We're getting very, very close. The father of history, they call him, because he's the first known historian. And he says, of that part of Europe nearest to the West... I am not able to speak with decision. I by no means believe that the barbarians give the name of Irandus to a river which empties itself into the northern sea, whence, as it is said, our amber comes. And this is the point. Neither am I better acquainted with the islands 
called the Cassiterides, from which we are said to have our tin. It is nevertheless certain that both our tin and our amber are brought from those extreme regions. So Herodotus himself, he'd never been able to, uh, to go to Tarshish or find anyone that had come from Tarshish, but he knew without any shadow of a doubt that the tin came from this group of islands called the Cassiterides. This was the location of the tin of the ancient world. Fast forward a little bit in ancient history to the time of Julius Caesar. And he came to Britain, didn't he? He invaded it. And he says that the provinces remote from the sea produce tin. So by the time the Romans got there, tin was in production in Britain. And those upon the coast iron. Another ancient historian, Diodorus, 8 BC. He says, now we shall speak something concerning the tin that is dug and gotten there. He's talking about Britain. They that inhabit the British prom promontory of Bellirium by reason of their converse with the merchants, so they were established traders, are more civilized and courteous to, to strangers than the rest. These are the people that make the tin, which with a great deal of care and labor they dig out of the ground, and that being rocky, the metal is uh, mixed with some veins of earth out of which they melt the metal and then refine it. So again, the tin is coming from Britain in the ancient world. And if you like that, check this quote out. This is the last one, by the way, if you find history dry. The Cassiterides are ten in number, so a small group of, of islands, which Britain is one of, and lie near each other in the ocean toward the north from the haven of Arab Arabi. Of the metals, they have tin and lead, which with skins they barter with the merchants for earthenware, salt and brazen vessels. And this is really interesting. Formerly the Phoenicians alone from Gades engrossed this market, hiding the navigation from all others. When the Romans followed a certain shipmaster that they might discover the market, the jealous shipmaster willfully stranded his vessel on a shoal, misleading those who were tracking him to the same destruction, escaping from the shipwreck by means of a fragment of the ship, he was indemnified for his losses out of the public treasury. So isn't that interesting, brothers and sisters? Perhaps that's why Herodotus said, wasn't quite sure where his tin came from, because the Phoenicians were so um, protective of that source. It was so valuable to the ancient world where they got their tin from that they were willing to scupper their own ships to stop the Romans getting there. And of course, we know that eventually the Romans did get to Britain, and we sh we've shown, haven't we? that they did tap into the metal markets uh, and the metal production that was going on. But interestingly, we have a connection here, an ancient source which connects trade with Britain to the Phoenicians, Tyre. A very interesting uh, non-biblical connection. So, does Britain have these metals? Yep. Were they mined in ancient times? Yep. Were they traded with the Phoenicians? Yes. What about clue number six? Are they going to take over one of the prophecies said in Isaiah? From Tyre, from the Phoenicians. And isn't it interesting, brothers and sisters, that Britain did indeed take over and dominate the ancient trade routes of the ancient world, particularly around 1601 when the East India Company was formed. When basically uh, Britain just dominated all of those trade routes, both in the West, but most importantly in the East. It took over from the power and the influence of the Phoenicians. It even had its own currency in India. It owned parts of the land of India. Eventually it got so powerful. So we can say that Britain fulfills that requirement. It did take over from the uh, influence and power of Tyre. How about this one, number seven? A colonial power. Well, it's pretty much a no-brainer, probably the easiest one. Um, we know, don't we, that, that Britain is the mother of many colonies, known nowadays really as the Commonwealth. And uh, they're all over the place, aren't they? They're independent though, aren't they? That's very, very interesting. The young lion, the independent states of Tarshish. And here we have, um, near where I work, there's a, a plinth up on one of the buildings celebrating 60 years of Queen Victoria, her diamond jubilee. And we can see that this is when all these uh, lions, as it were, were whelps. They were part of the British Empire, ruled over by Queen Victoria. 
And interestingly, look, there's little lions in the corner there. Not that we hinge our point on that. But it is interesting that you can see that that's how it was being presented. They're all together. But now we're in a situation, aren't we, where India is separate, where Australia is separate. We've got all these independent powers, uh, the United States, that have all come out of a mother Tarshish, a mother lion, a mother Britain, so to speak. And it's amazing, isn't it, how many signs we see around us in our day-to-day -day lives of um, our country of Britain being associated with lions. When I say our country there, by the way, we're strangers and pilgrims, don't get me wrong. The country we live in is what I mean. So, you know, Trafalgar Square, we've got those things, eggs, uh, England football team, lions everywhere. And what's fascinating is, is, I love this one. I'm sure some of us have seen it a few times. Because in the World Wars, particularly World War I, what's really exciting is that, that Britain was often depicted as a lion. And its col colonies were often depicted as young lions. It's as if the angels are saying, brothers and sisters, if you're confused as to who the young lions are, just have a look at some of these things. A pointer in the direction of Britain. So we can be confident that Britain fulfills that particular clue of being colonial. What about this one? Can we look at the Gulf region of Sheba and Dedan and can we see activity of trade by Tarshish? And I think the answer to that is yes. William Hague there in December is investing in the Gulf deliberately and for the long term. If you go to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office's website, and look under the Gulf, it says, we want the UK to be the Gulf's commercial partner of choice. Trade between Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish. And brothers and sisters, it's rare that a month goes by without having a news story about, of some shape or form about connections between the growing trade links between Britain and the Gulf. In fact, brothers and sisters, did you know that this very week, Prince Charles has been over to Saudi Arabia. You might have seen some very funny pictures of him doing a little Arab sword dance in full garb, which I found quite amusing. He's, he's there, though, to help drum up trade. And he's just said he's going to extend his trip to go to see the part Bahrain and the United Arab, Arab Emirates. And while he was over there, a deal that David Cameron was trying to seal when he first came into power back in uh, November 2012 was signed and was confirmed between Britain and Saudi Arabia for buying a ton of, uh, well, 47, I think it was, uh, fighter jets. We're seeing a lot of trade being done in this region. And if you, um, if you pick up Bible in the News, um, there is a, uh, an article on there today all about some of these ties which are growing. The Parliament uh, did a report last year on the importance of UK ties with the Gulf, and it listed four key areas defence, counterterrorism, energy security, and trade and investment. The merchants are there, brothers and sisters. The connections are there. And look how deep those connections lie. Do you know what this is, brothers and sisters? This is in Bahrain. Okay? And you have there Prince Andrew stood next to some very important. Um, Arab rulers. And they've all got together to celebrate Great British Week. You know, how, how many places on the planet would celebrate Britain? Well, the Gulf region is. Uh, and so that is an interesting tie, isn't it, brothers and sisters? This, this is a campaign that the British um, government is, is launching all over the Middle East, uh, sorry, the Gulf region, of being great, Great Britain, to, to drive trade. This is Vince Cable, uh, an article from last month in the Financial Times. And he says, if we can get them investing heavily in long-term infrastructure projects, that would be ideal. He will announce the creation of a Gulf investment team that says this article, and he did. There is a specific team that the British government has set up only to go to the Gulf to generate trade, and it's working very, very well. In fact, I think there's now a fast-track visa for people in some of the Gulf states to be able to come over to Britain to make this trade easier. When you go on the British government website, we read that relations with the Gulf states are of huge significance to the UK. And when you actually look, particularly in London, at who owns what in some of the most prestigious London areas, you'll find that the shadowy hand of the Gulf states seems to be behind everything. For example, Qatar 
own 20% of the London Stock Exchange. You know, that's, that's unbelievable. They own 25% of the Shard Building in London. Sorry, that was 95%. I read that wrong. 95%. They basically own it. Uh, the great symbol of London, the new Shard Building, owned by the, one of the Gulf states. They own 26% of Sainsbury's. The whole of the Olympic Village is owned by people from the Gulf. And so, brothers and sisters, we have this trade in operation. And it's a two-way thing, isn't it? And we can see it working um, as we would expect from Bible prophecy with British traders in the area of Sheba and Dida. But we ask the question, well, would Britain really be uh, up for challenging an international confederacy that comes down into Israel? Do we have any signs of that? Because we've not, you know, when we look at Britain, we don't see, do we, a massive military power in that region. But we don't see a massive military power, but we do see them in the past challenging powers which would seem to be great, greater than them to protect their trade interest. Here is the Strait of Hormuz, okay, just north of the Gulf. And you might recall that in 2012, Iran was getting a bit, uh, you know, a bit big for its boots and it decided to suggest that it might close this Strait of Hormuz. And look who challenges. The UK warns Iran, don't close the Strait of Hormuz. They weren't happy about this. They actually, they actually challenged Iran. And afterwards, the Royal Navy dispatched a £1 billion worth destroyer to the Gulf as Britain sends a clear signal to Iran that trade route will stay open. So not only is Britain in that territory with its young lion partner of the US, but it is also willing to challenge, as it will do, here in Ezekiel 38 verse 13. Art thou come? to take a spoil they are in the gulf and we can see them at work so does britain fit well yes the descendant of japheth the maritime power trades in global markets located to the west, located located to the west a source of silver iron tin and lead they take over from tyre a colonial power a trading power in the gulf so if you have any other suggestions as to who tarshish is you've got to be able to put it across these clues and demonstrate as clearly as we've been able to do today, if not better, that your suggestion fits. And I don't know of any other suggestion, brothers and sisters, that fits like this. This is not some sort of pioneer blind following of what Brother Thomas has said, is it? These are reasonable, considered conclusions that we can make. And we can be confident, I believe, in these things because no other power fits the bill. So what does it mean to us as we are here in the latter days? What encouragement can we get? What other signs can we see? Well, what it means to us is that when we look at the world just before Christ returns, this is what we should expect to see. Two power blocks arising. The Gog of Ezekiel 38 and then the Sheba Tarshish Didan group. And clearly it shows us that the Tarshish and Sheba Didan group, their military and economic strategies are different to the European, Russian and North African strategies. There is some sort of separation of the powers, isn't there? And this is very, very interesting because what you'll be more probably just as familiar as I am of some of the recent news coverage just, you know, over the last five or six years probably just as familiar of how annoyed the people of Britain of some have of the become recent news coverage, the just, growing you know, the uh, red tape of Europe. Of how a campaign like this one is, 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 is on, underfoot. This is the Daily Express's campaign, reporting all the problems with Europe. Get Britain out of the U EU, it says. We demand our country back. And of course, we know that the government under pressure has had to really um, confirm that we're gonna, the British people are going to get their referendum. And it's seen the rise of this party, UKIP. The UK Independence Party, and there's their leader, Nigel Farage. And look what it says on their website about last year. It says that last year was the year that saw us come of age. And this party is all about independence from the power of Europe, which is what we'd expect, wouldn't it, from Bible prophecy. But what's fascinating is that the Independent did a poll just last month, and they found that UKIP topped 
the Independent on Sunday poll as the nation's favourite party. What a, what a, what a shake-up that would make to politics in Britain. And we read here that Nigel Farage, the leader of UKIP, he wants to shake up politics even more in 2014. So keep an eye on these people because it seems that they are being compelled to push Britain in a direction which will separate Britain from the uh, military and economic strategies of Europe which is heading for the United States of Europe. And as we've said, David Cameron's really been pushed into a corner to promise an EU referendum. And so we're seeing cartoons like this, aren't we, uh, in our press of the impending separation, it seems, of Britain from European politics. And so when we come to the end picture, we can see all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle coming together, just as our pioneer brethren foresaw from their understanding of Bible prophecy. God has mapped out a future for Tarshish. You know, if we had time, brothers and sisters, we could go to Isaiah 60 and, Isaiah, and Psalm 72, where you read of Tarshish being a power in the kingdom age, a power that brings gifts to the Lord Jesus Christ, a power that helps bring Israel back to the land, back to the Lord Jesus Christ, a power that is motivated to serve God. And, you know, you look around at our nation that we live amongst today and the, and the Tarshish nations, and we see them driving in the secular direction, don't we? Something has to change. And so what a responsibility we have to witness to the truth. And, it, and we mustn't be despondent. Because the power of Tarshish will turn to Christ eventually, brothers and sisters. Because that is the, the, the map, the road map that God has laid out. Just to conclude, I'd like us to turn over to Isaiah and chapter 2. Because it's all very well, brothers and sisters, us having this as an intellectual knowledge in our brain. Oh, isn't it nice? Britain's Tarshish. But it's got to affect the way we think, the way we walk before our God, hasn't it, brothers and sisters? And in Isaiah chapter 2, we have another prophecy of the latter days. It's mentioned there in verse 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days, or in the Hebrew, the latter days, that the mountain of Yahweh's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. The time period of the kingdom, brothers and sisters, in the latter days, the days that we live in today. But look what it says about the nations in verse um, 10 or verse 11. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of man shall be bowed down, and Yahweh alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of Yahweh of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. The flesh has to be subdued, brothers and sisters. The pride of man. But the sobering thing, is that Tarshish is listed amongst the proud. Look at verse 16. And upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all the pleasant pictures, and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and Yahweh alone shall be exalted in that day. So we have here God's view of the nation of Tarshish in the latter days. Haughty. Lofty, proud, in need of bringing low. So brothers and sisters, I think the exhortation to us has to be, are we separate from the society around us? The society that God looks at as being haughty and lofty and antagonistic to his ways. Do we indeed, as the psalmist has said, have a broken and a contrite heart? which God would not despise. Because it is this characteristic, is it not, that we should all be seeking to develop within ourselves. So associating with the things in this society we live in is not going to help us, is it, to do these things because God is going to bring that society down to humble it so that it will accept the Lord Jesus Christ and God's ways in that day. And so brothers and sisters, 
All these signs of the times show us that Christ is indeed coming. That Britain is being compelled to take up a position, unbeknown to itself, of the merchants of Tarshish with Sheba and Dedan. And so, the real question for us all, including myself this, to this day, is are we ready 